Hello and welcome everyone to our Star Reader Zoom chat of the week on this beautiful, cloudy Thursday afternoon. Uh, and we have what I consider to be a marvelous guest. Uh, Professor Christopher Castro is with us today. He is the associate head, very impressive title, of the University of Arizona's Department of Hydrology and Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, he, is, he is in a sense, I'm gonna dub you our resident monsoonologist. You are the Sultan of precipitation in this region, sir. <laughs> and, uh, we are, we are de delighted uh, to have you with you, to have you with yourself, yes, to have you with us. Uh, before we begin, I just want to point out to those in attendance, if you have a question, uh, direct your cursor to the bottom menu bar of uh, your Zoom app, and you will see mute, stop video, participants, and chat. Click on chat to open the chat feature to the right of the screen, and if you have questions you wish to type in in text form, do that using the chat feature, or you can simply go uh, to uh, your uh, <laughs> the little blue shield up in the right hand corner of your own image and you can raise your hand and we'll call on you in that fashion uh, to ask a question. So uh, my first question for Professor Castro as I've dived into your resume, what in the heck is regional atmospheric modeling? <laughs> So uh, this is where we, if, if you think of uh, like a map of the United States, just to put it in simple terms, we put a box over a certain region of the United States where we want to simulate the weather or the climate at whatever time scale that we want. And we're only simulating weather and climate within that given region. And we're using boundary conditions to that model from a coarser resolution global model. So the regional model is sort of like a lens, if you will. It provides a greater magnification more into the, the finer scale processes involved in weather and climate. So it's really important we use a model like that here in Arizona during the monsoon, because that's really what's necessary to represent our, our monsoon, monsoon storms well in our model simulations. Well, that must require a great deal of uh, data input. Where does the data come from? So the data comes uh, to produce our real-time forecast at the Department of Hydrology and Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, we use data from uh, existing uh, global weather prediction models provided by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So we're, we're feeding those data into our regional model and then running our regional model uh, typically out to about 48 hours during the monsoon. Hmm. I, I notice that occasionally in terms of news that you are called upon because of your expertise to comment on this or that story. For example, I think the recent one in Arizona about a developer hoping to develop a large uh, water consuming structure for a Facebook like or an internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and you, you, uh, you are quite the party pooper. Uh, <laughs> talking about the realities of water. And with that in mind, I wonder how you handle the politicization of science that you must, are you, you experiencing that a bit these days? Uh, well, I've experienced it a majority of my career and I'm very conscious of that uh, in the kind of work that I do. Um, but, um, usually in forums like this one, what I try to do is I, I really try to meet people where they are. So if, if they do have a question um, or if there are doubts, for example, about climate change science, I, I just try to offer them the best information that I have and, and tell them the truth as, as I know it. That's been informed by my research career and also my participation 
in these community exercises that have generated our uh, and informed our national climate change projection strategies here in the United States. Huh. Well, I see we have our first question from Kathy Donahue. Uh, if you wish to unmute yourself and ask the professor, please do. Okay. Um, I was curious whether the, um, the monsoon rains we had about two weeks ago that, that started in the early morning and seemed to come from, from the north um, mm -hmm. as opposed to the southeast and the southwest. Was that an anomalous kind of pattern? Um, um, you know, our monsoon storms can come from various directions. So they can, and it all is dependent upon where the uh, subtropical high is located over the Western and Central United States. What was interesting about uh, uh, the early part of July is that monsoon ridge was located kind of north and west of where it usually is. So it was located like in the Great Basin and up in the Pacific Northwest. So when you get the monsoon ridge and that sort of configuration, uh, you get storms that tend to propagate uh, from the north uh, to, to the south or from the, the northeast to the southwest. So the, the meteorologists, uh, especially in Phoenix, uh, take very close note of this pattern because it, 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 uh, it can cause what's called rim shot events where you get storms coming directly oh, down off the rim where they, where they can organize and propagate and can cause severe weather in the Phoenix area. And that's, that's a lot of what we experienced in July. Hmm. Interesting. Good, good question. Uh, we have another one. We have a question in the chat. This comes from Sarah Brown, my colleague. What defines a rain as a monsoon and not just a rain? So this is a, a interesting question because um, let me start out with what the how the weather service defines the monsoon and just for all of the the viewers here um, the origin of the word monsoon um, literally means season it's derived from Arabic so when you even say monsoon season that's linguistically redundant. Um, so that being said, um, the Weather Service made a decision about more than 10 years ago now to define the monsoon as a set period that goes from the 15th of June to the end of September. And they do that uh, not because it's necessarily uh, likely to rain on June 15th, and it, it probably won't, um, but this is kind of the earliest we could possibly get monsoon rains climatologically. And so, so it's mainly for purposes of public awareness. Um, that, but uh, before that, um, we had used a variable definition of the beginning of the monsoon that was based on our dew point measurements at the, uh, the Tucson Weather Service. And so the definition of monsoon onset is 54 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for three consecutive days and the monsoon onset is defined as the first of those three days. If you go by that definition, climatologically, our monsoon arrives here about the 3rd of July. Hmm. Well, I have a question. I was uh, in a quarrel with a climate change denier, which is not that uncommon. And I was, I was struggling to make in this toddler's manner, best I could, the argument that what we're seeing is the simultaneous extreme of we're wetter and drier at the same time. And I failed miserably with my explanation. Mm -hmm. Could you perhaps give me a, a better, uh, pardon the word, ammo, but uh, better debating points to uh, express that idea of wetter and drier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is a, this is a really key point. Is that um, when you look like for the example at the weather here in the United States, just in the United States this summer, we've had areas where we've had record heat and then areas like here in July where we have had record rain. Now, how is that possible? It's, it's related to a, an intensification of the global hydrologic cycle. So when you get a feature like a big subtropical ridge that is sitting over you, when you're 
when you're right under that feature, you're likely to be hotter and drier than you, it, you, you would have been otherwise. But when you get in another regime where you're, you're on the other side of that ridge or you're under the influence of low pressure, and then it's more conducive for precipitation, then you're in an atmosphere where it's warmer and it can hold more water, water vapor. And so then when it rains, it's more likely to rain harder. And so um, this summer has been quite exemplary of both this phenomena of extreme heat waves all, not, all over the world, not just in North America, and also extreme precipitation. So you think just to, for, for the heat waves, we had 121 degrees in, in British Columbia, unheard of. Um, we're having a heat wave. We had our hottest temperatures here, our hottest June in Arizona before that. In terms of the, the precipitation, we've had our wettest monsoon, our, our wettest July here on record, at least in Tucson and several other places. But also they've had record flooding and rainfall rates in other areas of the world. So think of what happened in Germany. Think of what happened in China, um, and this is and and in India in their monsoon there. Just for example, in India, they received 23 inches of rainfall in the state of Maharashtra in 24 hours. So you average that out; that's almost an inch per hour. And now that's insane. How is that possible? It's possible because the atmosphere is warmer and it can hold more water vapor. So when it rains, it pours. Mm. I, uh, I posted in the chat your uh, Twitter address. I hope you don't mind. It's a very informative uh, account. And I, I, I perhaps enjoyed, I marveled at uh, some of the imagery of the flooding that you described uh, from around mm -hmm. the planet. And particularly that footage of Nogales, which I had not <laughs> looked at yeah. and over again. But yeah. my gosh, that looked to me like the footage of Germany. I was- Exactly. And-, and uh... And I don't mean to, I, I, I'm sort of chuckling because when I think of, of some of the posts I've seen, I, I, everyone is joking, oh, you see a, a taco stand going down the, 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 the flooding. Um, but I don't want to, I want to be very serious about this because um, in, in point of fact, in those floods, I read in another post that um, actually someone died. And was trapped in a vehicle. So this is, it's really not a laughing matter at all. Uh, looks like we have a question from a uh, participant, uh, Richard Spitzer. Can you unmute yourself and uh, feel free to ask your question? Thank you. Uh, I grew up in Nogales, so I'll have to check out that video. But my question is, um, I heard a talk by a U of A climatologist a few years ago on how the jet streams are shifting due to global warming. And she was saying that Phoenix and Tucson- If I can interrupt you, who was it? Uh, she's the person who appears on Nova and has a very distinctive laugh. Is it Joellen? Yeah, I think okay. that's who it was. Okay. And she was talking about how Tucson and Phoenix were likely to become warmer, but that Tucson was far enough south to become perhaps more tropical, which didn't happen last year, but maybe is happening this year. What's the research on jet stream movement at this point? So um, I think uh, it, it's it's I think in, in in spite of what you might hear in the media, um, I think there's still a lot of uh, scientific debate on this. So it's clear that when you, as I said before, when you get under these regimes of you're under a ridge or you're under the influence of low pressure, the extremes within those regimes are getting worse. But whether or not the jet stream is getting more wavy or sluggish, um, I think that uh, there's a lot of evidence that says that with a... Um, with decreasing um, uh, sea ice in the Arctic and a warmer Arctic, that uh, this decreases the equator to pole temperature gradient. And that's what drives the jet stream in the first place. So you get this more 
kind of, the idea is you get this more kind of meandering sluggish jet stream but that's not the whole story there's also the jet stream is also influenced by what goes on in the tropics that that uh they that tropics essentially communicate information to the mid latitudes and also affect the waviness of that jet stream so how much of each factor is interplaying we don't know um uh, we're just beginning to get a handle on this and and i think we need more research using a lot more model power com computational modeling and also uh, use of um, multiple ensembles so we can tease out the effect of natural variability from a climate change signal. But certainly this summer, um, uh, we've been in that mode that it is a wavier jet stream. And when you're in a certain part of the wave or another part of the wave, you get the heat or you get the wet. Huh. I'm wondering with the, the blessings of artificial intelligence, if you're able to synthesize data from these different models into larger models of uh, planetary climate behavior. Well, uh, you know, um, the, the short answer is uh, yes, sort of. Um, so what artificial intelligence machine learning can do is imagine it's a box and that you're, you're training an algorithm in this box with a series of inputs and, and your desired output predictors and predictants. And so the, the algorithm, um, essentially like, if you will, like a linear regression, it's sort of like statistics. So statistics are great, but they're only as great as the data that you train them on. So um, the, the, the question in the use of machine learning, artificial intelligence techniques is, can we eff effectively capture all of these nonlinearities in the climate system in order for us to make uh, confident, um, more confident climate projections and more regionalized climate projections? And I think, again, I think it's a great opportunity um, as long as we recognize the, the strengths and the weaknesses of the method. Hmm. Well, we have some comments and questions here uh, in the chat group. Uh, where are we on desalinization? So um, th this is kind of fits in a milieu of questions of a, a bigger question I get, which is what, what are we going to do about our water supply in Arizona in the future? So um, desalinization is one option. Um, so there are several there's kind of two flavors of that. One is that you're desalinating this more brackish groundwater. So it allows you to use groundwater that you wouldn't be otherwise able to, to use. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that we get, we do desalinization from either the Pacific or the Gulf of California. And, um, that's a that's going to be a pretty expensive proposition, and uh, then in the case of of a pipe to the Gulf of California, you've got to have some negotiation with the Mexican government, and uh, that is it's going to be a, a seriously environmentally degradating to wherever you would do it in Mexico. I will say that. Hmm. Yeah, with that in mind, uh, this is. <laughs> really not directly relevant, but I was reading the story about the notion of opening the floodgates upstream of the Colorado because Mead and Powell are so low. Mm -hmm. And I keep wondering if this is, uh, you know, stealing from, uh, <laughs> to pay the piper, you know, stealing from Peter. And yes. the same thing with cloud seeding, uh, they sound like wonderful attempts, but with a mega drought in mind, is there a kind of futility about these efforts? Or um. I, I would lean to say that efforts like that are are more futile than useful. I do think uh, on a limited scale, cloud seeding might be useful. And I know um, it is being done and actively investigated in the West United States. For example, uh, Idaho Power has a big initiative. They're working with the National Center for Atmospheric Research to figure out 
like if they if they seed the clouds, how much more uh, snow would they get out of this? Um, mm -hmm. So it it may have some utility um, where you're dealing in a situation with orographically forced precipitation snow during the winter. Um, when you talk about convective precipitation like the monsoon, I, I don't think there's very much research at all that demonstrates the effectiveness of any sort of artificial um, means to enhance precipitation. And that's not to say it's, they're not trying it in other places in the world. I just read a story that out in the in the United Arab Emirates, they're they're sending drones out to to zap clouds to try to uh, generate uh, uh, bigger precipitating product particles and more rainfall um, when they get it there. Huh. Uh, another question in our uh, chat section for you from Robert Kiver: How much do hotter urban areas expanding around our planet have to do with climate change? On a local scale, uh, a lot. So if you think about just in, in, in our biggest urban area in Arizona, um, the, the, the trends in temperatures in Phoenix, um, especially at night, are largely driven by local urban effects. And so um, those urban areas are, are the, big, the, the big impact from a climate change human health standpoint is, is you're making these urban areas hotter at night because they're retaining more heat. Um, so uh, this has a really profound implication for human health and also energy use. So if it doesn't go below 90 degrees in Phoenix at night, then um, that means uh, our, our cooling systems are running harder at the very time when most people are away and not in centralized spaces. They're in their homes and the energy use is, is gonna go disproportionately up. Which leads me to a, uh, another question about this cartoonist here enjoying his air-conditioned home here in the Southwest and wondering, I'm certain that we're going to have to discover alternatives to air conditioning, I assume, because of the carbon footprint? Well, either alternatives to air conditioning or more, um, more ways that we can generate alternative energy. I think that's the, that's the better strategy. And I think, it, I think in that score, um, there's a lot good that's going on in Arizona right now, um, that we have some of the greatest a potential for solar energy resources in the in the continent in the contiguous United States. So if you drive along I-8 towards Yuma, you will see a big uh, solar producing plant called Solana out, uh, and uh, and so that that can produce a I don't know exactly how much energy it produces, but it produces a substantial amount of energy. Um, so if we and and also they have solar farms more locally that uh, TEP is uh, shifting their, their energy production profile more toward renewables and that, and that big, big ugly coal plant out there by the base is eventually going to close as they shift toward more renewables. So it's not necessarily, I think that we're going to have to rethink our air conditioning systems, but it is the energy from, from where we, we get to power those. And, and also, um, I would mention on the individual level, a lot of folks are putting solar panels up on their roofs. Um, so that is, uh, that's also uh, changing the energy profile. Yeah. Thank you for and that. It saves you money and it saves you money. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we have a question in the chat from Kent Barraby. Why is low pressure associated with rain? So low pressure um, tends to be associated with air rising and cooling. And when you can do that, when you can get air rising and cooling, you can form clouds and precipitation is the short answer. Huh. This is great. This is all tuition free so far, isn't it? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, Kathy Donahue says, asks, is the rain we have had so far a predictor of what the rest 
of the monsoon will be like? Uh, the short answer is uh, n probably not. Um, because the monsoon can be very fickle. So you can have one really kind of wet period and then it can be dry uh, net for the next few weeks or the month. Huh. So, um, so generally speaking, no. But it, I think at, at least from the, the latest short to medium range uh, forecast that I have seen coming out of Weather Prediction Center and, and, and uh, the Climate Prediction Center, I think we're looking good for August for this year. In our chat, uh, Melody Mirand, Myrand, forgive me for mispronouncing your name. I have a question about the data collection. How long has this data been collected and where can it be viewed? Thank you. So that's a really broad question. So what kind of data are you talking about? I yeah. Okay, I, I'll just be more specific. I would like to know about temperatures and specifically in Tucson over the long range, over mm -hmm. like how far back does this data go for just temperature ranges? So we have reliable temperatures, um, uh, certainly back to the, the 1940s and the 1950s and, and probably even some before that. So if you're looking for like, where, where is the official government repository of, of this information? It's called the National Centers for uh, Environmental Information. Uh, so uh, it, it was formerly called the Climate Data Center. So it, it's located in Asheville, North Carolina. So, so all of these records uh, are there. If you wanna say, where do I go and get historical climate records for the entire United States, it would be there. Okay. Also, too, about rainfall. I was very curious mm -hmm. about how long have you been recording um, data that, you know, can be viewed that specifically addresses how much rain have we received from year to year over the long, over the long haul? So, um, similarly with precipitation measurements, we have really pretty good handle on observed precipitation, uh, certainly back to 1950. Uh, but there have even been uh, attempts to create uh, precipitation products based on whatever observations we have all the way back prior to the turn of the century. Uh, so, so it's really amazing that, that if you wanted to, 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 to look at trends in precipitation, like in the Tucson area, you could probably go back to like the, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so these are the gauge based measurements. So if you're looking more like at radar derived precipitation, like the, the images you see on the news um, that you can actually get an estimated precipitation from those from, from radar measurements, um, those, uh, in, that, those information go back about let's say 20 to 25 years. Okay, thank you. Uh, in our chat, Mr. Pickerel has a question. Do weather predictions beyond five days have any reliability? Um, it, in terms of telling you whether it is going to, for example, rain at a particular point, no. Um, and so there's a, there's a basic principle um, that applies to numerical weather prediction called chaos. And, and what this means is that you can never perfectly specify the, all of the initial data that you need to get a perfect prediction in a highly nonlinear system like the atmosphere. So, so it, if there are just slight variations in how you specify those initial conditions in a model, you'll get very divergent results the further and further out you go. So that's fundamentally a limit on our confidence in numerical weather prediction as we go further out in time. A, a question from my childlike infantile perspective. I'm wondering as these extremes corrome around the planet, if, they, if somehow the frequency of them doesn't increase. 
Do they sort of cascade one upon the other, affecting each other's behavior? Sure. Or do they remain fairly consistent in the frequency of the extreme? So, so what, uh, I don't, I mean, because the answer is going to vary depending on where you are, but I can get comment to this point, look, just from the work we've done on monsoon precipitation here in Arizona, what we found is actually that um, the extremes, extreme precipitation episodes don't necessarily uh, get more frequent, but they actually might get less frequent. But when they occur, when they when the extreme precipitation events do occur, they're even worse than they used to be. So fewer, but more extreme. Uh, uh, we have a question from Kathy Scott. What causes a microburst? I've seen it rain on my side of the street and just cross the street, a light sprinkle. So microbursts are very common um, here in the Southwest. And the reason why that is, is because when you have a precipitation falling from a thunderstorm, um, and especially as it falls below the cloud base, um, that cloud base is uh, sub, what we call subsaturated. So the relative humidity is below 100%. So that, though, that rain coming out of that cloud will evaporate into the atmosphere. And that evaporation causes the air to cool, to become denser than its surrounding environment and sink rapidly to the ground. And so if it, it, depending on the, the, how strong that evaporation is uh, in a really strong microburst, you can get winds upwards of hurricane force. And that's, uh, and, and in fact, that's happened here in Arizona, just this monsoon season that we've had a few episodes like that. I must say a few years back, I did lose a porch roof to a mm -hmm. microburst. Right. Which so up close and personal, that was exciting. Yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, this, is, this is an interesting point. A book recommendation from Patricia Dow, a book called The Water Knife, Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future, a uh, fictional book. I'm wondering if for pleasure you read apocryphal literature, Professor. Uh, it's, <laughs> the, the, the answer is no, I, no, no, I don't. And it's because it's, it's if nothing else, it's, it's difficult with two young kids anyway, and two young kids under pandemic conditions is even worse. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, another question, you know, when you, when you get together with your colleagues and you must talk about the sociology, the culture about what you, you well, you're, you're in a sense a biblical prophet crossed with Nostradamus, crossed with Isaac Newton, uh, attempting to predict the future, which is very challenging for uh, most earthlings. And I wonder if you've given thought to what kind of cultural changes will have to take place to address uh, these challenges. Wow. Um, yeah. We have an hour. Yeah. Well, this is, yeah, this is the kind of question I think in the evening after I'm I'm on my second glass of wine and I'm sitting there and I think, you know, what is this all about? Uh, that's kind of that kind of question. Um, so I give you my answer. I think there, the first is um, uh, there's technological ways um, we can get out of or, or get out of the climate change crisis. Um, so we can we will have to have some way to adapt. And that's more the purview of what I try to do in my research is to, is to provide information that can be used for what I'm gonna call actionable adaptation strategies. Um, then we can uh, try to mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions by shifting to things like renewable energy and, um, uh, and, and electric cars and so forth. And, and then there's also this, this emerging uh, technology of carbon capture and storage. So uh, you, where you're actually physically removing the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, I think that's very technologically interesting to me. Um, and, you know, we'll, and we'll see if there's sort of a leap 
in the technology going forward. Um, uh, so that that's the that that's the technical piece, and I think we're making good strides on the technical pieces. But um, I think there's this other piece, which is uh, our attitude toward environmental sustainability. And, and this is where it gets a lot more philosophical. So if you think about how Arizona has developed um, to create the lifestyle that we enjoy here, um, it was because we, we were able to engineer the Colorado River. We were able to provide this air conditioning in an otherwise inhospitable climate. And we created these, these really big urban spaces and so in, in the long term, is that sort of way that, that we live, is that sustainable? And I think we have to change our mindset that we are thinking of everything, every, our, our interactions with this planet in terms of, of sustainability. I think this is gonna become the new buzzword for the 21st century. Almost to say, if I if I were the president, I would have a a a, a cabinet level position of sustainability. Hmm. Good answer, uh, Mike Conway from Arizona Geological Survey uh, asks you to comment on the fate of Arizona's forested lands, the Ponderosa Pine Forest, in the face of rising temperatures over the next several decades. Um. Great question, um, and I, uh, you know, it's this isn't a preface. My answer with it's not necessarily my area of expertise, but uh, I know enough about it to give an informed answer. And the and the answer is this: is that climate is is becoming more extreme, and and so when we're getting these these hotter and drier periods in Arizona, particularly right before the monsoon. Um, we are exacerbating our risk of wildfire. And when those wildfires are occurring now, they are, they are uh, more spatially expansive and devastating. If you think of like the Telegraph fire this year, the Bighorn fire last year, I always think of the Bighorn fire because it, it destroyed 60% of the forest in the Catalinas. That's not an insubstantial number. So the question really is, um, when you when we have these mega fires and they're destroying large swaths of forest, and then will the, the ecosystem will try to regenerate, but can it can we really recover that forest as it was in this harsher changing climate? And I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, and it might not be good. Mm. Oh, good answer. Uh, we have a question from Patricia Dow. If you can unmute yourself, feel free to ask the professor your question. Okay. Uh, is there any way to know with any degree of accuracy how much water is in aquifers? Uh, so um, I think in certain aquifers, yes, if we were able to and again, I'm not, I'm not a hydrologist, so I'm giving you a little bit of a, uh, of a higher level answer, but, but where you are able to monitor the aquifer, so take measurements of the groundwater table, then yes, we can quantify how much water is in there. The problem is that, um, are we doing that across, say, the entire state of Arizona? And in order to be able to do that, the state would have to have some regulatory authority to be able to monitor the groundwater. And that doesn't exist. And so the danger therein is, is then everybody is going to dig their well, um, whether it is cities or our, far, our agricultural interests, and then we don't really have a good idea of what the groundwater table is doing, aside of, of things like measurements like we can get from satellites. We don't, we can't go 
and do the in situ measurements to know at those exact locations what the groundwater is doing. And that's, a, that's kind of a scary proposition. And this is again, an intersection where um, the impediment to knowing that answer lies with the politics, unfortunately. Sorry, I'm just kind of stunned to be reminded of that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I've attended a couple of hydrological conferences through the years as an entertainer, and I was always astonished at how few policymakers invited just chose not to attend. I just thought it was the damnedest thing. To me, hydrologists like yourself and climatologists are like biblical prophets that it seems policymakers are relatively disinterested in speaking to or listening to. And that's my rant. Okay, I'm finished with that rant. <laughs> uh, back to the question in the chat. This is a good one from Thomas Magore. Should I get rid of my swimming pool? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, this, this gets to a larger issue of like, who's the, what's the elephant in the room when it comes to use of water in Arizona and the West. And so it, it's a, it's sort of a common perception that you see these big expansive cities like Phoenix and Las Vegas with lawns and, and swimming pools and, and that you say, well, that, that, there's, there's where we need to reduce the water and everybody should really focus on these, these wasteful urban areas, but that's not true. What uses most of the water is agriculture. 80% of the water from the Colorado is going towards agriculture. So actually urban areas have decreased their water use per capita and become more water use efficient. So fill your swimming pool, especially if you've ripped out your lawn. <laughs> That's too long for a bumper sticker. <laughs> Don't feel guilty. Don't one, feel but... guilty about spilling your pool. Well, th this, this brings us to a, 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 a side issue that makes me stammer and stutter. And that is of uh, these vast uh, farmlands in the United States purchased by uh, area corners of the world undergoing drought and they still want crops so they purchase land here yeah. use use water here uh i don't know what the answer is to that uh i'll leave that to you because you've got well the well it, it it it's um it this is the how we're regulating our water and our agriculture so um it's it's whether we're going to allow for example, foreign interests to come and buy our agricultural land in Arizona and then raise water intensive crops. Yeah. Uh, Robert Kuyper makes a point that I'd like to pose as a question. Does reducing agriculture's water mean reducing food? Uh, I'm not an agronomist, uh, so I- Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, but um, I don't think so because there's a lot we can do in terms of better water use efficiency. Um, so yeah. we can do things like drip irrigation um, that, that can maybe substantially reduce the, the amount of water. And, and, that, and to some extent, even in places like the Imperial Valley, um, they're already doing that. And so, so it's possible. And another kind of question we need to ask is, well, what type of crops are we growing? So maybe we can still do agriculture, but it's a different kind of agriculture. So we really need to think about what are the really most water intensive activities? Um, and, and, and I think therein a, a, a really big one is probably livestock. So you think of like, if you have a big livestock, a cattle operation out there in the desert, how much water does that use? Yeah, uh, we have a good question here from uh, Kevin and Naomi Green. What are the most exciting projects underway at the U of A or among your students? Among, among so students in our department? Yeah, I assume okay. so. Yeah, so, so sure, I think, uh, this area of machine learning, artificial intelligence was mentioned. 
So this is really going to revolutionize the way we are uh, doing hydrology in the future. Um, so, so from a modeling standpoint, we can replace certain components of our of, of, of models that have existed for 30 or 40 years now with these, these AI, uh, artificial intelligence machine learning components. Um, and then and then scale those up to model things like groundwater at a continental scale. So we have a national depiction of like what groundwater is doing across the contiguous United States. I think that's very exciting. Um, and then on the weather side, uh, a lot of what, what my group's work is around is, is high resolution modeling. So kilometer scale modeling where we're representing the storm scale processes, for example, here in the monsoon, and then uh, applying that paradigm to longer and longer time scales. So like, can we do, can we improve uh, forecasts weeks out or months out or climate change projections? I think there's a, and then maybe even combine that uh, also with this machine learning artificial intelligence. I, I think there's a, it's a lot of exciting things uh, and uh, I, I got about 20 years left. I can't, I won't be able to get to all of them. <laughs> Let's see, I think, oh, here's a good uh, question from Mark Cook. When Tucson Water basically says we have little or nothing to worry about for future water supply, how much of that is hopefulness as much as anything else like politics? Well, um, I, I think to Tucson Water's credit, um, they have done the best they can to uh, make our water more resilient here in Tucson. So if you go up to Gates Pass and you see uh, the water retention ponds in Avra Valley, groundwater was mentioned before. So what Tucson Water is doing is groundwater banking. So they're taking the treated wastewater and they're putting it in those retention ponds and then letting it infiltrate. So that provides a source of banked water that we can use in the future. So if if situation gets even more dire, then there's other measures we can, I say we as a community can potentially take. Um, so now we're doing groundwater banking, what we have. So we're letting the groundwater do the last step of the like the natural filtration before we store that in groundwater. Uh, above that is uh, this uh, pejorative, pejorative phrase, toilet to tap, which is we need to think about when using our wastewater as a source of potable water once it is treated. And they are already doing that in, Southern, in areas of Southern California. And it, it is frankly how Los Angeles water supply or, or that LA metro area's water supply is going to be sustainable into the 21st century. They'll have to do it. And I think at some point we will too. Hmm. Uh, we have a, a question from Allison Hughes. Can you please, this, and this is of course the big one, can you please discuss how future water needs are measured in relation to our growing population's demand for housing and business expansion? Is there a tipping point and what would that be? So um, I know that when um, uh, new construction and development is authorized, there has to be a guaranteed source of water for that. Um, like say a, 50, say a 50 year supply. Um, the problem is that the climate is changing so fast, we uh, how reliable are those those 50 year or some odd projections? And I would submit, um, if you take just this summer as an anecdotal example, maybe not so much. Um, so uh, there there will come a point, I believe, and this goes back to the, what I said before about this issue of sustainability. We just cannot continue to grow and grow without some, uh, uh, some conceptualization of what are our resource limits. 
Um, and so there will become, there will become a day of reckoning. And I don't, and I think the way it's probably going to happen, and we might even see it happen in the next few years, is when uh, the the drought conditions get so bad that then they then there are mandatory cuts to our water supplies from the Colorado via the CAP. And then we're going to have to start making some very difficult choices forced upon us. Um, and the law states when you get there, there's a pecking order of who gets cut first. And the agriculture will likely feel the brunt first. Um, we're fairly well protected in the urban areas, but um, but looking out 50 to 100 years, who knows? Well, well, no, well nonetheless, I'm still optimistic. When someone asks me, you want to continue living here? I'll say, yeah, Professor Castro lives here. <laughs> He's Mr. Monsoon. He would know. Well, <laughs> again, 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 we, we, I, I, I don't, I think it, it's like anything in science. Like if you're trying to communicate public messaging, if you're not conveying like what you know and, and that frankly, some optimistic picture of the future, I think the public is just going to tune you out. That's been my experience. And, and so I really want to emphasize when we're thinking about the future, there, there, there is a lot of, of optimism in the picture here. The shift towards renewable energy, the, the ability to uh, rethink how our water supply here in Arizona, um, and, and to, to, to think pragmatically and practically. Um, so yeah, some things will have to change, no doubt. Um, or maybe our lifestyles will change, but but we always have to framework frame this in that we can we'll still have the ability to maintain a high quality of life uh, that we enjoy here in the Southwest. I believe that. Well, uh, thank you for being an evangelist for reason. Uh, we have a, a question here from Judith in the chat. What proportion of a monsoon storm's water? makes it into the water table? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I can't give you an exact percentage because it actually depends on how the rain from that storm occurs. So if you're talking right at the beginning of the monsoon or if, the, if that uh, storm is going over a burn scar, for example, the more impermeable that soil is, either because it's dry or it's burned, then all that water is going to wash off and then nothing will penetrate into the groundwater. So you only start getting meaningful groundwater infiltration if you get monsoon rains over a sustained period of time and the soil gets wet enough that then you can get you can start getting some infiltration. That really didn't happen a lot last year. It's probably happening this year because just we've had so much rain. So it doesn't happen all the time, but it only happens when you have rains for a sustained period of time and a good monsoon. Yeah. Mr. Robert Kuyper makes a point in the chat that uh, leads me to a question. He notes we've had droughts in the past that forced Native Americans to leave the Tucson area, which leads me to the question of uh, the discussion about the term mega drought. Is there any sense of... Uh, among the uh, Nostradamus characters out there that you might work with, mm -hmm. of predicting the span of a mega drought? When you say mega drought, does that mean a century, couple of centuries? Any so, so, as, so, so as best to, to estimate, you know, the, this idea of mega droughts, um, we really have, have, have to heavily rely on what we call paleo climate records. So natural proxies to monitor the climate of the past. So past those, beyond those periods of, of reliable instrumental records. So hundreds or thousands of years. So the, the best that we have to characterize the mega droughts in the, the recent past, I'm gonna say the last several thousand years are really the tree ring records. And what those indicate is that very consistent with what you just said, that there are there were mega droughts in the last several thousand years that lasted 
decades or even centuries at a time. And so these were so profound that we know that they disrupted this uh, and adversely impacted the Native American societies that inhabited this part of the earth. Uh, so um, can that happen again? Well, you could argue that we've been in a mega drought essentially since the turn of the 21st century. But what makes this mega drought different as opposed to say those ones in the tree ring records is that what is the driving force of this drought is the increase in the temperature, not a decrease in precipitation. And that's the scary difference. And so, and so, so that it is warmer so even if you're getting snowfall or, or precipitation in our in our water in our areas where we we that are our bank of our water for the Colorado River in the high mountains and the Rockies, well, your that snow is melting earlier, and more of it is evaporating to the atmosphere, hmm. and so that alone, independent of how much precipitation we get, is driving the decrease in the stream flow. Well, Professor, this has been such an interesting conversation. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us for a, uh, a wonderful afternoon. And my question is, when people in Tucson at social occasions find out what it is you do, do you get peppered with the questions at cocktail parties? Yeah, very much like this. Uh, yeah, yeah, very much like this. <laughs> well, I appreciate your positive attitude. It's yeah, contagious. No problem. Uh, yeah. Sarah and just, Brown, yes. And, and just to your viewers, um, please know that uh, the, the University of Arizona and the Department of Hydrology and Atmospheric Sciences in particular, we, we serve as a community resource. So any questions or concerns you have, um, we're here to help. Um, that's part of our mission as a land grant university here in Arizona. So, so we're 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 happy to uh, serve and outreach to the public. The jewel of our community. Thank you so much, Sarah Brown. Uh, what's coming up next week? Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to echo Fitz's comments, Mr. Castro. You made your comments so, your answers so simple that I could understand them. I, I told Fitz today, I said, I can't leave the chat because I feel like I don't understand any of this. I don't even know, but I feel like I learned so much from you and I'm so appreciative for you just making it simple and easy to understand. So thank you for that and for your time. You're, you're quite welcome. Um, so we next week, we have a couple of star staffers joining us. So we have longtime editor Debbie Cornmiller and also our digital editor, Samantha Munsey. We've been doing so much on Tucson.com with our digital subscriptions and things such as that. So we are going to do a digital how-to, how to get the best out of Tucson.com, our e-newspaper, our apps. However it is that you're accessing the news digitally, we want you to make sure that you're getting everything out of it because there's a lot of features that maybe you might be missing. And also for research purposes, newspapers.com um, has digi pretty much every newspaper has digitized their paper now. And so that's a great resource um, to be able to go and do research on different things. So we look forward to having both of them. We'll also have opportunities for question and answer. So if you guys have some specific questions about um, your subscriptions, bring the questions. We're excited to answer them. Oh, that sounds terrific. So once again, I'm having Sarah Brown and the Arizona Daily Star. Thank you, Professor Castro. May we have a rainy afternoon. Thanks to each and every one of you. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>